Um, yep, so my name is Daniel Silk. I'm a senior location data analyst in the topography team at Linz. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I think there haven't been a huge number of opportunities to talk about what we're doing with open source GIS in Australasia over the last few years. Um, we have our own QGIS meetups in New Zealand and um, Nathan's been coming up for those. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool that this is happening. I hope it leads to a lot of similar events like it in the future. Okay, so a little bit of background about me. Um, my um, career actually started in Newcastle. So this is not a picture of New Zealand. This is a picture <laughs> of Australia. Um, I started working at Crown Lands in New South Wales about 10 years ago um, and worked there for about six years. And since then, I've been working at Linz. So I've been using QGIS for uh, just about three years. Um, Linz is the New Zealand government department responsible for managing Crown property, for um, managing property rights, so the survey and title systems, um, and for various areas of location information, so uh, geodetic, hydrographic, topographic, addressing data. Um, I guess in New South Wales, we're the equivalent of your land and property information, Crown Lands, and um, Australian Hydrographic Office. We're based in Wellington, um, and we've got two other offices in Christchurch and Hamilton, and we've got about 600 staff. Um, so a, a short history lesson on our background with QGIS. Um, Back in 2004, we started using Postgres and PostGIS in the geodetic team, and that was due to some frustrations with the IBM Infimix products they were using at the time, um, and just getting good support for it. So they found that with Postgres and PostGIS, even though it was free, they had a great mailing list community. They could fire in questions and get back answers really quickly. At the time, um, I'm told that QGIS was at 0 0.1, um, but it was a tool that they could use to visualise that post-just data. If we move on to 2008, um, a post-just data store was set up within Linz, so we had the hydrographic, topographic, addressing data um, in there, and there were more QGIS users um, hooking into that. Um, and the first internal application was developed, so something um, was built to work with cadastral adjustment blocks. Moving on to 2014, uh, QGIS 2.6 was deployed via Citrix, Citrix environment. Because there are no licensing fees, we can deploy to 600 people um, and everyone can have access to QGIS if they need to use it. Um, since then, there's just been more teams switching from some legacy solution to managing their data in QGIS. So um, our place names, Gazetteer Data, is all managed via QGIS plugin now. Um, our address points and our addressing roads are all managed by QGIS plugins. So I was doing a quick tally, um, and I think we've got over 20 people that are doing some form of open source GIS development um, across the organization, and another 20 or so that are using QGIS for data management every single day when they come into the office. Throughout that time, we've um, made a few contributions to the core of QGIS as well. Um, so back in 2008, uh, we added advanced selection tools. Um, and as recently as last year, we've um, paid for some WMTS rendering improvements so that it's, um, you can cancel your WMTS rendering and it's incremental, so it speeds it up. So why am I talking about scripting? Um, I think the biggest thing that's changed in my career is, is switching from um, you know, doing a few ArcGIS scripts and creating a few models to um, developing full, you know, effectively applications that extend on QGIS um, is sort of you know, having a, a couple of files on the local computer and meddling with them every now and again to having to need a really robust workflow um, to make sure that everything's humming along, just managing a lot more code overall. Um, so in the topographic team at Linz, our main function historically has been producing a couple of map series. And they get printed as paper maps, and they get delivered as, as digital files as well. So we have uh, a Topa 50K series covering the whole of New Zealand, and a 250K series. Um, but 
we now have an increased focus on the data that's used to create those maps. Historically, it was a byproduct. We, um, you know, made maps and then released the data for free, and people could build on them, etc. Um, but the focus of that data was still just to create a map. But now they're actually seen as key national data sets, so we're extending the, the capabilities of, um, you know, better attribution, better spatial accuracy, etc. Not because we need it for map production, but because it's you know overall benefit to New Zealand. With that, we need new tools. So the the data that we maintain for the maps is um, using some one spatial software. We can't easily modify it, um, so we're turning to QGIS. That's a screenshot of our um, road data plugin. Um, so it, yeah, turning to QGIS because it's something we can easily get. You know, a whole bunch of people. Um, modifying a workflow within QGIS. So, um, I'm just going to share a few things that we do in our workflow. Um, perhaps, you know, you'll find something there that you can bring into your own workflow as well. Um, or at least you can see that, um, you know, we're an operation that has quite a large number of QGIS users, and I think that's probably more rare than common. Um, so, you can see how our process is working. So the first step when it comes to building something new is we capture some user stories. A user story is just a simple description of a requirement. So it usually takes the form as a role I want to feature, so that reason. So an example would be, as a topographic data analyst, I want to identify all unnamed roads under 300 meters um, so that I can check that these roads are suitable for a Topo 50 map. One of our increasing challenges is that our data gets better Topo 50 doesn't need it, so we're looking more the other way, like we need to generalize the data for the Topo 50 map. Um, so this is an example of one of those tasks. With the user story, we capture acceptance criteria, and it's basically like, um, you know, I can choose which layer I want to run the script against. It's the set of things that the user of that tool expects to see when they're running that script. Um, all roads in the output are unnamed, they're all shorter than 300 meters, the output is provided as a geo package, probably actually a shape file. <laughs> the output retains all of the attributes of the input, that sort of thing. Um, and as developers, like before even looking at a solution, that's just a really nice little checklist to run through. We then look to start with a test data set. And by that, I don't mean we've got this massive sample of roads and that we're going to use that for testing. It's good to obviously have some sample data of what the user's going to input, but we then want to create a focused test data set, which actually has the cases that we want to you know, have in the output, want to avoid from the output. Um, so here I've got six awesome looking roads. Two of them have names and the other four have varying lengths. Um, and I've given them some descriptions so I know what I'm testing with each one and I'd expect from this script that I'm scripting that I get the two at the bottom, the one that's under 300 meters and the one that's you know, right on the border. The next point um, is probably the thing that um, I guess has changed like the most in my workflow. Um, going from someone that builds a few scripts on the side to like actually using version control to manage code is you know, like, you'll never look back. Um, it's just so incredibly useful. So I, f I feel like there's sort of this common trap where people start off in the GIS industry, um, they're, us they're using a tool to, you know, do some visualisation and cartography, they get better at it, they start scripting things, um, but along the way haven't learnt version control. And I'm talking about, so we use Git and Git for version control and GitHub for um, hosting our repositories. Um, every single time, we have, a, we have an intern program at Linz, and for the last three years we've had two interns in my team. The first thing we teach them on the first day is how we use Git and GitHub. Um, and even though a lot of them have come through like postgraduate programs at universities, they've done a lot of QGIS scripting or ArcGIS scripting already, um, I haven't found someone yet that has also learnt version control while they've been doing that. So 
I feel like it might be a little bit of a common trap, but it's something that, you know, if you're looking at ways to improve your GIS automation abilities, um, learning it is the number one thing. For our team, um, we've been growing and being able to like see each other's code and easily collaborate on it, it's fantastic. Managing production versus development versions um, and easily comparing any code state so that we can see what's changed, um, why something might be failing, etc. There's also heaps of free courses online, um, but it's so worth paying for, paying for some structured training as well. So. With our, the user story I was showing earlier as well, um, we keep them as GitHub issues because then we can close them with the commit that actually solves the problem. So the, the user story and the solution to it are held really closely together. Um, and you know, if we ever need to go back and see what do we actually do, you know, we've got the issue, we've got the solution. So version control allows you to keep track of changes. But there's some other ways that are, that are other things that are quite important to do um, to also keep track of changes. Semantic versioning, there's a, there's a website, semver.org. Um, it's basically just describing how you should um, manage your version number for a piece of software. Um, QGIS follows it, so a great example that we've just seen is you know, the major version of QGIS is changing from 2.0 to 3.0. Um, that means there will be API breaks, you know, there will be a bit of pain, but then, you know, the greater good is multi-canvas and 3D and everything else. Um, and then, you know, iterating that minor version where you've got a whole bunch of feature changes, but you haven't broken any APIs. Um, we use release branches for all of our minor versions, so I can easily switch between a version of code that's on someone's like I might have two different um, groups of users that are on different release versions for some reason, and we can easily switch between their release versions. And just maintaining a human readable change log as well. So um, QGIS again has a fantastic visual change log, but having something like that where users can see what has actually changed, or you can refer back to see what has actually changed without having to examine code, just seeing, you know, line by line, here's what um, was modified. We also demo frequently. So at the moment, we demo to users once every two weeks. Um, at each of those demos, we check against the acceptance criteria that they've brought in. And frequent demos just allow for really fast fails. You don't want to go off, work on something for three months, come to your users at the end and go, here's what I've developed, and have them go, that's not at all what I was talking about. Um, so having the two weekly update keeps us all engaged and all on the same track um, and allows for you know, other ideas to come out between, between users and developers. So I think it's really good to intentionally, you know, we just have standing meetings set up, bring in the people that we need into the room. Um, the next thing is tests. Um, so it's, it's taken us quite a while to get um, some proper testing going for our QGIS plugins um, and for our scripts. Um, I think when you're extending someone else's code base, it, it can be a little more challenging. But for example, um, like you can run unit tests inside QGIS, so you can run them just like any other script. Um, so we've got, in this case, a test that, you know, long roads aren't in the output, that um, named roads are not in the output. If someone goes and changes something and runs those tests, they can be confident that it's still doing the same thing that it was doing before, which you definitely need if you're you know, scaling up. Um, so running those tests in QGIS got quite tedious because we had to constantly input scripts that were changing, etc. So we built a little plugin, which I'm going to demo. QGIS. Unfortunately, my toolbar is off the screen. 
Okay, so um, so here's my short unnamed roads test. If I click on that, in that blink of an eye, what it's actually doing is grabbing my code to solve the um, problem with the six roads, running it, and then checking to make sure that the result was correct. Um, I don't know what changed between 2.14 and 2.18, but this got a hell of a lot faster, so that's really awesome. I can test all of our scripts to do with QAing roads um, in like a second, 83 successes, yay, I've done everything correctly, move on. Um, that script in 2.14 took like two minutes to run, now it takes like a two seconds, so that's fantastic. We do the same thing with plugins and GUI elements, we fake draw a road on the map, um, make sure that the result's correct, um, runs from the same configuration manager, so um, being able to do that is, is awesome. Right. Um, headline's a little bit lost there, but we also want to be able to use continuous integration. So I don't just want to be able to test on my local machine when I'm developing something. I also want it to run automatically when I commit. Um, that seemed really hard with QGIS, so we, but we are fortunate that it's an open source community so we can look at what other people are doing. Um, so it seems like there's two approaches. Um, Boundless, which is a consultancy, they've developed a Docker environment where you can spin up an instance of QGIS and run a bunch of tests. Um, we've been using that so far. The other option is to mock a whole bunch of stuff um, like fake QGIS elements, which is a bit more abstract. Um, so I'm not gonna go too much into it, but um, effectively, whenever we save our code to GitHub, there's a hook to Travis CI. It builds a virtual machine with QGIS on it, and it runs our tests, and then it comes back with a, yep, you did everything right, or no, you didn't. So even if you forget to do your tests locally, um, it's happening in the cloud automatically, and if something goes wrong, we're notified. So that's really cool. I, I guess, you know, because QGIS isn't licensed, like, you know, you can spin up a version of it in the cloud at any time, um, and, and it makes that sort of stuff really easy, and it's cool that we can hook into what someone else is doing. It's also got support for 2.14, 2.18, and 2.99, so we can simultaneously test different versions of QGIS, and when users move on, we already know that our stuff works. Um, or in the case of 2.99, we already know that it's doesn't work at all, and we need to change everything. But that's cool. <clears throat> Sorry about the headings, they've all moved off the land and into the sky. Um, this one says keep up with QGIS. So we have developed quite a few things that we've then found have been added to QGIS core later on, and um, that's awesome, because we can now hook into that tool. One example was, um, when we were building the roads plugin, we, we built a little toggle for turning off and on topological editing and turning off and on snapping that was visible on the toolbar. I think that's a feature in QGIS 3 now. Um, so you don't have to dive into menus to meddle with your snapping settings. Um, we also built like an entire separate workflow for extending roads because of the you know, feature that was shown before where you can click on the little plus and extend a road that was quite difficult before. Um, so keeping up with QGIS, what's happening in new versions is obviously also really important when it comes to building solutions. You don't want to do a whole bunch of work and then find out um, that you could just hook into a new version. Um, we also want to, I, I'd like to better identify where there's opportunities for something that we've done just to be in core. So, you know, there's, if, if I'm building something that seems like everybody can make use of, and it shouldn't just be sitting in a plugin, then um, you know, paying for it to be added to core might be the better option rather than me spending my time on it. It's good. So I've already mentioned visual change logs, but they are like I go back to them all the time just to remember what the things are that you know I can now add into my plugin because they've um, been added between different versions of QGIS. They're an awesome resource. 
Um, and then also just keeping tabs on the enhancement proposals. There's a GitHub repository which lists all the things that are being built in QGIS, probably not all the things, but a, a lot of things. Um, so that's awesome to follow as well. Um, and obviously finding out from Nathan on Twitter what he's working on at midnight <laughs> is really cool too. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, the slides are available online. They should be publicly available. From there, you can grab any of the links. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer. There's a clearer one.